um, series on the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm Shona Mortier, the director, for those of you who don't know me. I'm introducing Danford Chipongodze and Andres Motau, who facilitate this series. And today our topic is Abolish the Stalker State, a Global Fight. Um, and it's going to be bringing up all the conversations and all the discussions that have been had in the last, over the last few months around defunding the police and what a world without the police would look like. Um, so today we are very excited to introduce Hamid Khan, who is an organizer with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Um, and today Hamid is going to be talking to us about some of his work and also in the context of what's been going on over the last few months um, with the Black Lives Matter hashtag. Um, you know, we said in, what, in one of our first seminars that there's, a lot, there's been a lot of foundational work that's been done by organizations, individuals, fighting systemic racism, um, advocating for equality, and they've all led up to this moment. And the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition is one of those organizations that has been working on these matters. Um, Hamid can tell us more about that. Um, so Hamid, welcome. Thank you for getting up at the crack of dawn your time. I know it's seven o'clock in LA, seven in the morning in LA. We really appreciate you enjoying it, you're joining us today and we are looking forward to engaging with you. I'm going to hand over now to Andres or Dan who are facilitating and I'm just signing out but I will be right back. Dan? Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Andres, facilitating sorry. today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Civil Society. Just the basic uh, house rules to everyone. Please make sure that your mics are muted and your videos are uh, preferably. And if you have any questions, you can raise your visual hand or you can uh, text your questions in the chat bar. Uh, for those of you, this, uh, uh, this seminar is, uh, webinar is recorded and it will be made public. So you've got an option to change your name if you don't want to, if you want to remain anonymous. Um, yeah, and you must keep the, the, the conversation going in the, into, in, in the chat box. So Hamid, welcome to the center. I'm giving you uh, close to 35 minutes, to, uh, 30 to 35 minutes for you to give your talk. At the end of your talk, we'll have conversations. We'll have, take questions and uh, respond to them. Thank you uh, very much. Over to you, Hamid. Thank you, thank you, and uh, uh, happy to be here. And uh, it's an honor, and it's it's uh, appreciate the invite. Uh, so maybe I'll I'll pick up from um, uh, maybe just a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Hamid Khan. I have been. I'm originally. I was born and raised in in Pakistan, and I migrated to the United States in the late 1970s, in 1978 or 79. Uh, and since then, I uh, moved to Los Angeles and I've been organizing in LA uh, for about 30 plus years. Um, but was one of the, part of the founding member of the South Asian Network, a community-based uh, grassroots organization, uh, working with the, the South, South Asian uh, immigrant community. I was also involved in organizing the taxi workers in Los Angeles. And then uh, over the last 10 years, uh, helped found the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, uh, which primarily was, uh, was, was uh, coming together of a bunch of folks uh, who have had a history of frontline organizing in Los Angeles uh, against uh, state violence, against uh, police violence, and various other types of, uh, uh, of uh, state-sanctioned and systemic racism, as uh, uh, Shana put it. Um, and in that, one of the primary focus was that how, uh, particularly uh, post 9-11, how counterterrorism and counterinsurgency tactics were, uh, were rapidly expanding in domestic policing. Um, of course, it's uh, uh, nothing new. Uh, this has been particularly since post-Vietnam that had been a part of expanding the, the police state, uh, but especially with the advancements in technology uh, and especially with the expansion of, of more police powers uh, and state powers in light of the Patriot Act and various other legislations, uh, how uh, it, was, it, was, it was sort of giving life to what we had always known 
that, that uh, in a sense that when we talk about counterinsurgency, then who are the insurgents? And in the context of the United States, who are the hostile communities and which historically have been the, 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 the black, indigenous, brown, uh, migrant, queer, trans communities? So now uh, the tactics that were being deployed on the battlefronts of Iraq and Afghanistan were rapidly becoming a part and parcel of everyday policing. And under the guise of national security, which provided a perfect cover uh, for, for, for massive containment and, and deployment of tactical programs that would further contain and control and criminalize uh, uh, various sectors of the population. So with that uh, as a grounding piece, I think the, the, the next piece was that when we talk about systemic racism, when we look at the, the, the economic, the political, the structural, the, the, the cultural um, elements of racism, then we have to really map it in, in its wholesome. We have to look at it intersectionally. And we have to map that how, when we talk about intersectionality, that, that how oppression and state violence is deeply, deeply intersectional. Given the, given the, the scale of resources, given the scale of, uh, uh, of, of, of weaponry, given the scale of its capacity to, to, to create PR, to, to, to market violence, uh, and to, as uh, Noam Chomsky would say, manufacturing consent from people uh, uh, and, and especially through the, through the white gaze and through the, 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 the deeply embedded ideologies of white supremacy and settler colonialism, uh, patriarchy and capitalism, what we also saw was this increasing uh, sort of a religion uh, in, in scientific objectivity, that how scientific objectivity with the advancement in technology was given, uh, was, was being elevated to the next stage that, um, and with, with an example of like predictive policing and other forms of policing on the ground that computers are race neutral. Uh, risk assessment tools are basically just, uh, you know, a process of, of uh, mathematically uh, uh, doing an accounting of your, of your own histories, of your past, of your current. So if you had ever committed a crime without uh, factoring in uh, that, that uh, number one, that who has been deemed criminal, uh, who is constantly being placed in databases, whose uh, quote unquote crime uh, is, 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 in, is more uh, accounted for than the other, uh, and how that by itself inherently, that, that is the, the form of systemic racism, that of course, uh, uh, not to oversimplify, that that's how these things are going to roll out. So, so in a sense, started mapping out that, that okay, then what is the fight? And, and for us, uh, when I say us, and I have a few slides and I'll, I'll share that as well, was a coming together of uh, people from various sectors who were based out of Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, which is, um, which is virtually, I would say, the most impoverished community in the United States. It is a, it is a 50 block area right there in the shadow of extreme wealth. And this is where the extreme wealth and extreme poverty intersect in downtown LA, uh, that right across the street, you have massive encampments on the street. And of course, the demographics are all overwhelmingly black. Uh, demographics are also increasingly overwhelmingly black women and children on the streets as well. Um, so this was a, um, uh, our comrades who had been fighting the fight uh, in Skid Row around homelessness, around extreme poverty, Los Angeles Community Action Network. Those, they, as a founding member of the Stop NAPD Spawn Coalition, created a home for, for us. Uh, and what it did was really help us ground ourselves, really help us understand the narrative that what does surveillance, spying, and infiltration mean? How do we demystify and bring these practices to earth, whereas most of the time, uh, there is a whole uh, heck of a sensationalism uh, attached to it because surveillance typically in the United States is, you know, just of the FBI, the counterintelligence programs of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the NSA phone tapping, um, and, and, and everything in between, uh, you know, just informants, uh, uh, undercovers, this, that, and the other. But to really just get beyond that, uh, it was quite evident uh, that if when we talk about white supremacy and if police and the enforcement of white supremacy through police 
was the basically police as the knife uh, and the dagger for white supremacy than surveillance. And infiltration was the tip of that knife. And in essence, how surveillance uh, became uh, a, a tactic that how race and poverty and suspect bodies are policed. So, so that really helped in, in, in building our understanding that, okay, what is our fight there? So it is, it is way beyond the, the perceived or conventional understandings of invasion of privacy, which of course, for what does privacy even mean uh, for, for, for extremely poor and people of color and migrant communities and trans communities, your bodies are constantly bared. Uh, so this, was, this, this helped us really fully understand or, or, or understand, more understand that, that how these agencies uh, and the tip of the knife or these things are created with the intent to cause harm. It is not about public safety. It is not about uh, uh, serve and protect as the claims are made, but it is intentionally created with the intent to cause harm. Like I said earlier, how to contain control, how to contain populations, how to control populations and how when needed, that how banishment and displacement and extreme harm can be inflicted. Uh, and then along with that, also recognizing and understanding that how crime has always been a social construct, that what actions had been deemed criminal and by whom, that who has the power to, to, to write down those, law, those laws and, and what is law and order and what is uh, unlawfulness and disorder means and who is creating disorder and what type of disorder is deemed on, on the regular as criminal activity and who falls into that. So, so that's the sort of the quick backdrop of uh, what helped us uh, sort of ground ourselves and spent a whole lot of time, at least for the first seven, eight months, uh, just talking to people. Uh, because historically speaking, the, the, this domain around surveillance had been very much um, sort of occupied by the nonprofit law firms like the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and others, uh, whose response historically had been, and of course, you know, that's, that's what they do. Their, their work is around legal action and litigations. Uh, their response was that whether, um, you know, First Amendment rights or the constitutions, whether the, what level of constitutional violations had happened. So historically, we saw lawsuits being filed or fixes being proposed through legislation, but still at the same time, that remained a very limited response that, that remained within these confines of an existing system, uh, existing constitutional layers and, and, and a constitutional framework, which for many of us inherently is a blueprint for oppression to begin with. That who wrote the constitution, whom does it provide protection to, and who even has access uh, to seek protection under the constitution as well. So uh, I'm going to quickly just uh, go through a few um, uh, slides and I would be happy to uh, just, uh, you know, for the next 10, 15 minutes. And because I'd love to then, um, um, uh, and then, you know, just I, I, I see Dr. Aziz Chaudhary, he's been uh, really appreciate his presence. Uh, he's been uh, connecting with us. So, so excuse me, Dr. Chaudhary, if you've seen this before. So I just kind of, um, one of the things uh, that we always focus on is that while many a times uh, the focus is on the state and corporations and the impact of privatization on our lives, and of course, you know, in the United States, we live in a state capitalist system, the, the one area that continues to get a pass is the academy. And, and really kind of for us, it was critical to look at academic complicity and see that historically speaking, what intellectual frameworks had been created over time uh, that become a, a roadmap for state violence, that provide the fodder, that provide the justification. So here's a quote from um, a book that Dr. Edward Manfield had written and these social scientists back in the late 60s and 70s at uh, University of Chicago and then Harvard and and, and University of Pennsylvania, and who then moved on to be an advisor to Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. And also a little uh, vignette here, if folks are familiar with broken windows, uh, policing. So one of the architects of broken windows, James Q. Wilson, was also a mentee of Dr. Or Dr. Edward Banfield. Uh, Banfield had mentored uh, James Q. Wilson as well. So in this, uh, Banfield says that the implication that lower class culture is pathological seems fully warranted. 
Okay, so now, of course, like in a pathology, and it's a given because it's inherent, it's a part of the DNA of these people, these people, the lower class culture, uh, rather than waste time and public money implementing policies based on the false notion that all men were created equal, better to just face facts and acknowledge the natural divisions that exist. Uh, which again is, 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 this is also deeply imbued by a whole lot of propaganda. Uh, because while the constitution starts in the United States, uh, but yet at the same time, which all men are created equal, and, and this which is, comes down to a very narrow scope of the population, which would be white men with property. So everyone else, and even in the constitution, the, the uh, uh, person of African descent was deemed a three-fifth human. Uh, so, uh, so better just to face facts and acknowledge the natural divisions that exist. Members of the lower classes should leave school in ninth grade to get a jump on lifetime of manual labor. The minimum wage should be repealed to encourage employers to create more jobs for low value labor. And the state should give intensive birth control guidance to the incompetent poor. Uh, and the police should feel free to, uh, to crack down on young lower class men. So this is a, uh, uh, this is almost a carte blanche uh, uh, you know, just a green light uh, to, and, and I think what's, what's really also uh, critical uh, and to understand uh, that the time period that I'm talking about uh, when this was, uh, these types, this type of scholarship was also being, being floated um, was uh, right there immediately during the time of Civil Rights Act, uh, the Immigration and Naturalization Act. Uh, of 1965, civil rights bills of 1964, voting rights act. So all of these things are in motion where people are out and mass uh, uprisings have been happening, uh, which of course, you know, had been going on forever. Um, you know, so, so then immediately the recognition uh, that, wait a minute, like, you know, there's gonna be a whole lot of uh, uh, people seeking more rights, more equal rights. So how do we then, uh, reconfigure ourselves. What is our policing going to look like? And I think here also what we need to go back and, and draw parallels a uh, hundred years previous to this event. And that's again in the 1860s when the Emancipation Proclamation and when, when supposedly the slaves were freed um, uh, when Lincoln was president. But what we also saw immediately in the aftermath of, of freedom were black codes. And of course, the, you know, folks in South Africa and the past laws and everything else uh, are very familiar with that, with that history as well, which how the United States had basically exported its, its conditions and, and, and uh, state sanction apartheid uh, to other parts of the world. So this was, so these were already pre-existing conditions that we are looking at. And of course, the, the, the work, the, the uh, academic work around eugenics and floating eugenics and, and working on eugenics. Um, so going back to the black codes were again, that, that while people were free, but immediately realizing that what are we gonna do now because of free profit making and free labor, slave labor uh, has all of a sudden stopped. Uh, so laws like loitering, laws like you know uh, five or six people uh, congregating on the site, laws like speaking loudly to a white woman, laws like pushing your wares uh, after sunset were introduced uh, to, to deem them to be criminal. So again, going back to crime as a social construct, so people can be re can be incarcerated, and then there were clauses in the Thirteenth Amendment which allowed that if you were incarcerated, your body can be used for free labor in jail. So here we have circling back that on one hand, freedom from slavery was established, but yet reconfigured enslavement was also happening as well. Um, so in, at this time in the 60s, immediately the response was by the government, the instituting and, and the, 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 de the declaration of the war on gangs, the war on crime and the war on drugs. And that by itself created a whole history of, towards mass incarceration. Um, so again, uh, as I've stated earlier, for our work, it's really looking at, through the lens of uh, that how race and poverty and suspect bodies are policed uh, and surveillance is that tip and through the white gaze as to how the white gaze establishes that who's in and who's out and who's fully human and who's not fully human and, and who's deemed visible and who's deemed invisible and then invisible. Uh, these are some of the, the guiding principles that lead our work, like looking at it through a historical lens that it's not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. Um, these things have been going on forever and I'll go through a quick snapshot of that as well. 
of the creation of the other within the cultural and political and the economic context. And we talk about it at least in the United States as uh, multiple faces that historically have been paraded culturally uh, and deemed as criminal. Uh, and then how uh, with the deeming of the other and the criminal uh, deemed as a threat as the other, uh, how then laws have been pa passed to contain communities. For example, in the cultural context, the face of the savage native, uh, incapable of, of, of uh, self-preservation and tilling the land. So mass displacement, manifest destiny has to come in and we have to take over the land. The face of the criminal black, um, deemed criminal in perpetuity. The face of the illegal Latino. And we see how immigration laws and migration has been so has been socially engineered and managed that that, that you know the romanticism of European migration uh, at Ellis Island and, and then the threat of these hordes of people coming across from the southern border. So how race and the creation of the other is manipulated and how it's played out in in, in popular culture and those uh, and it's 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 interesting that uh, when references are made. Uh, to people of European descent in the context of immigration, it is all that all that little, and, and you know of course a little lovely lady of Italian American, but on the flip side with this potential gang member who happens to be coming from Mexico or or El Salvador and all of that. So so a lot of these are constantly being played out. Uh, the face of the manipulative Asian um, that when Japanese were interned and sent to concentration camps in 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 in, 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 in the war in the 1940s. The argument was, and the, the Japanese could have been here for five generations, but yet the argument was that uh, persons of Japanese ancestry contain enemy race blood, hence inherently disloyal and shall always remain unassimilable. So now uh, you could have been here. So again, like who's an American who can claim uh, full citizenship, uh, but yet at, uh, you know, if you are of a particular descent, you contain enemy race blood, hence inherently disloyal and can never assimilate. Uh, and then the, the, the terrorist Muslim, the face of the terrorist Muslim, the South Asian, uh, and of course the face of the deviant trans body and, and, and on and on and on. Um, so what also, but I also want to preface this by saying that our goal has always been building power, building uh, power on the ground. And we, we are very much a grassroots community or, or organization also want to share that we are not a nonprofit. This was a, a consensus-based uh, decision-making where people decided. Um, in full disclosure, we are predominantly, overwhelmingly an all-volunteer organization. Um, I'm one of the, the persons who coordinates uh, the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition and get a stipend uh, for that as well. Uh, but it's been, it's been coming together of people of various sectors, various backgrounds, unhoused people, undocumented people, people who are formerly incarcerated, um, you know, artists, a whole lot of students, uh, queer trans folks, uh, on and on and on. So, so that's where, in a sense, it's also an opportunity to claim the otherness because it builds power. That you know, there's way more others than that that is deeming us as as the other, and and we are not going to let them describe us, not going to let them speak for us. Uh, of course, you know, just as as somebody who grew up in Pakistan and and coming from colonized. Uh, places you always grow up being described by the other, buying being this this sort of sensationalist Rudyard Kipling uh, you know, just literature that who we are. So rather than uh, acknowledging that, that no, we're not going to let you describe us, we will fight back. Um, and then the desensationalize of the rhetoric of national security. It's always been that the Russians are here, the communists are here, this, that, and the other, and the fight is anchored in in the human rights. Um, this is a quick snapshot of the history of policing and some, some of the surveillance. Uh, lantern laws are laws going back over 300 years in early 1700s, uh, where if you were an enslaved body and you were out uh, in, in public, you had to walk with a lantern in your hand uh, to self-identify yourself as a threat. Of course, slave patrols, which were uh, very much a, the original formation of what we know as modern policing. Um, uh, especially in the south of the United States and other parts of the United States as well. And then we saw militias, black codes I just talked about, Jim Crow laws. These were laws uh, around uh, segregation um, and uh, around uh, uh, deep bias post-emancipation. 
Um, and then the red squads. The red squads are, are interesting. This was uh, the, the first covert intelligence gathering sections in local law enforcement that started in Chicago on the heels of uh, in 1886, I believe, uh, and 1888 on the heels of the Haymarket strike, which led to the creation of the International Work of Solidarity Day, or popularly known as May Day, uh, which was a fight in the United States for eight hours work. Um, so that's that. And then, so in a sense, this is a, a history of our policing that we have mapped out, which helps us understand that, again, not a moment in time. So what has been the history and the culture of resistance that has been built all along to fight back and push back as well? Um, Intelligence-led policing is a concept that uh, was also very critical in our uh, understanding as well. It comes started about 30 years ago, um, and which, which had a significant impact on policing as to where we are right now. Um, this basically was that how behavioral surveillance and data mining became very central uh, to policing. This is this is what would I would say that even legitimizing speculative and hunch-based policing, which it used to be like at random anyways, and nobody would question it, like a broken taillight, and and just by virtue of being a black person or or a brown person, an indigenous person, you were deemed criminal. But now giving it a veneer of legitimacy. <clears throat> of, of bringing in behavior, which is completely a relative concept because behavior is, is informed by so many different things and directed by so many different things as well. But just based on behavior, uh, the criminalization beginnings, the collection of information, processing and analysis of information, and the di dissemination of information, which then led to what we have, CompStat model, computerized statistical model, risk assessment, I would say now 30, 35 years later, we're looking at technology uh, which is now, you know, doing these computations of machine learning and artificial intelligence and on and on and on. Um, this is uh, quickly an architecture of surveillance that we have mapped out in, in Los Angeles, which, which uh, and I'll, I'll wrap it up in about five minutes, um, that which, which we, we mapped out, which, which outlines the various types of uh, human in, uh, and, and technology-based intelligence gathering uh, so the iWatch basically is the see something, say something program, which in a sense, it weaponizes profiling. It weaponizes, it, 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 it is an active uh, way of, of recruiting community informants who can then call and say, well, I saw somebody suspicious in the neighborhood. Um, so in a sense, then who is that suspicious? So when you look at the numbers, it's overwhelmingly people of color uh, who, are, who are deemed suspicious. So in a sense, through uh, active programs, um, weaponizing racial profiling and providing uh, the powers to, to, to particularly white communities and other communities and that definitely where race and class intersect and, 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 and rich communities uh, to really deem uh, folks going into the neighborhoods as suspicious and putting them into secret files and doing a whole lot of investigation. Uh, predictive policing, uh, trap wire technology, um, this is also one of the uh, uh, seminal moments where this happened on the heels of the 9-11 Commission report, uh, which led to Congress pass a law because the central thesis of the 9-11 Commission was that, uh, that the events of 9-11 happened because information was not being shared and dots were not being connected. So who, uh, and so these folks kind of just fell through the cracks, but now we have to create a system and a massive information sharing environment um, that really uh, people, that law enforcement agencies of all stripes, whether local or regional or federal or national or international, along with the, the private sector, the corporations and various other and public sectors uh, like city governance and all of that, need to be speaking to each other and creating an information sharing environment where information can be shared. Uh, and in that, they developed these programs like Suspicious Activity Initiative, which basically was that we know of known violations of the law, but what about people who may be thinking? And I think this, I, I put it in there because this definition becomes really crucial, which really doesn't make any sense at all. And the definition of suspicious activity is observed behavior reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning related to terrorism or other criminal activity. So now when you break it down, observed behavior, okay, somebody's watching somebody, which is reasonably indicative, which reasonably indicates of pre-operational planning that somebody is thinking of doing something of terrorist or criminal activity. So purely a speculative and hunch-based uh, policing was introduced. 
uh, and a lot of uh, even things like taking photographs, constitutionally protected activities were deemed as criminal, which led. These are just some of the 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 the, the tools that are used for surveillance. This is uh, uh, telephone based, so Stingray people know of, and a lot of these things are also were developed by U.S. Naval Navy and the Marine Corps. So a lot of when we talk about militarization of policing, it's not just the tanks and the grenade launchers, it's the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day policing and the tools for policing as well. This basically mimics cell phone towers and sucks up a whole lot of information from people's phones. This is uh, digital receiver technology, which is like Stingray on steroids, if you will, because even if you turn your phone off, uh, it'll suck up all the incoming information. This is a trap wire technology, which basically, if you're walking on the street, it, it, it gathers your information and sucks up a whole, and, and, and your image through uh, infrared imaging and, and sends your information to, data, to various databases through this box as well. This is a high definition camera, which was on the base of the helicopters, which is supposedly can pick up a candy wrapper at night from 5,000 feet, a license plate readers, uh, drones, body cameras, and, and this is freedom on the move that can through facial recognition technology can, can pick up all your imaging and all of that, which then leads us to, and I'll quickly run through this, that breaking down that, okay, let's look at the public sector, and this is the Department of Motor Vehicle, that how when we go in, how our information immediately is is explodes into various data points and how it is accessible by various public sector, private sector, law enforcement agencies, which then uh, leads to <clears throat> the stalker state. And this is what we are working on, that how information moves. So when we look at systemic racism, and I'll end with this chart, that when we talk about systemic racism, we have to look at it that, okay, let's look at the whole system. And when we look, so rather than not just law enforcement, but how our bodies are policed all across, how information moves within the public sector, private sector. So think of it not as a static Venn chart, Venn diagram uh, with static circles, but think of it as a, as a living organism, which is constantly in motion. And we are working with some artists right now who are trying to bring, uh, do some motion graphics to this thing as well, so one can better understand. So in essence, how information moves within the public sector, private sector, constantly moving around. So in essence, it comes down to the datafication of our lives um, and how our bodies are basically through that datafication are turned into a gazillion, almost a, a molecular existence. So where our, our, our being is being reconfigured and reconfigured and recreated. Uh, so even in the private sector, we see it all the time that how mind games and mind manipulation happens. So, I will stop right there. Um, and there's a whole lot of information shared, my apologies. Uh, but I think it's in order to ground ourselves and understand the work that we are doing, uh, which has to be, we have to look at it through a deeply intersectional lens. Uh, that's where the stalker state piece comes in. Thank you. Thank you very much, I mean, for the insightful uh, presentation. Indeed, we're living in a digital world. Um, we, I, I have a few questions for you. I'll take them in rounds. Um, the first one is, what, what are your thoughts or views on defunding the police? What would, what would a world without police look like uh, or community policing? So uh, number one, uh, uh, we have been, our work is really driven by, by, uh, by the work and, and ones before us who were abolitionists, who look at, to, at it as, as to abolish the police state. So, so for us, it, was, it has always been very fiercely abolitionist where we are not going to, to, to negotiate and compromise. Um, these, these tools of harm have to be dismantled. So in that process, of course, uh, defunding of the police has, has both sides to it. One is that it offers a almost a, a roadmap or it offers an opportunity uh, and then creates a layered uh, dismantling of, of, of tools and these institutions of violence. Uh, but yet at the same time, it can have a flip side effect as well, which has been happening uh, here as well. I would, I have to uh, say that that how the, 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 the political leadership and how these legislative bodies uh, play with this concept as well. That in a sense like, you know, defunding and okay, we'll reduce the budget on this side, but on the, on the back end, we will, in, uh, you know, just introduce programs 
uh, which will bring in more money to law enforcement agencies. So in a sense, it creates its own limitations in our, in our journey towards abolition, because for us, uh, abolition really means that it's a multi-generational journey of how we make policing irrelevant in our lives. So to that, it comes to looking at the alternatives then to your point as to what are those alternatives and, and how people are seeking those alternatives. I would also uh, caution us about the term community policing because for us, community policing really means uh, a counterinsurgency program because the, the idea and practice of community policing is very much rooted in occupation and it's a military type concept where you know people are and which is being practiced in the United States as well. So alternatives, there's definitely uh, a, a lot of attention being paid and nothing new. And I would also say that you know if you think about it, when we look at sanctuary cities, when when we look at various other programs, communities forever have been sharing resources and surviving. I mean, like you know, I mean by so in a sense we we have those models of alternatives on different levels. I mean, alternatives to policing are nothing new. Um, I mean, I, I have traveled through South Africa as well, having grown up in Pakistan, lived uh, in the United States for over four decades. Uh, so I think in a sense, to avoid uh, uh, interaction for many communities, particularly communities of color and poor communities, uh, to avoid interaction with police is goal number one. So in a sense, because how it can come back to, to harm people, um, knowing the inherent racism and structural and systemic racisms. Um, so in a sense, alternatives have always been there, but now it's looking at that, how do we pool our resources? We just had an example in our own community where one of uh, our Skid Row residents was tested positive for COVID. So how and, and the community mobilized uh, and identified that who could be, who could, who could provide some healing, who could provide services, who can be visiting them, who can organize um, a, a, a testing and things like that. So, so I think these alternatives have always been there in a sense, then, then how the fight for the resources come in. So in a sense, defunding really means in essence uh, of, of not replicating uh, by, by, in a sense, where when I so showed you the charge stalker state, that how the social services by themselves are a form of policing as well and part of the carceral state. So, so how those resources are then reallocated to the community itself, which then comes together and, and develop these systems and, and further, uh, you know, just consolidate and strengthen the, the existing systems within the, uh, the communities themselves of, of exchange of services and well-being. Thank you very much. Um, I see uh, Danford and um, Aziz, uh, they have posted links. You can have a look at them in the chat box. As well, there's a question on, don't you think artificial intelligence is threatening civil society movements? And how can civil society and civil society movements enhance themselves through these changing times? Absolutely. I mean, uh, very much uh, a threat to, to civil society. Uh, I think also we have to look at that digital policing and digital intelligence gathering. Uh, where is that data coming from? Uh, how was that data produced? Um, who was central to that data? Um, how that data is being managed and then being uploaded and what is being spit out? And so that's one way to look at it, that it's typically seen as garbage in, garbage out, or racism in, racism out, pre, uh, you know, previous records in of, of racist policing. But here, we need to take it beyond that. We need to look at it, and we have a tool that we have created called the algorithmic ecology, which basically decenters uh, 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 the, 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 the algorithm from um, various pieces. And let me just quickly, um, let me quickly uh, show you what I mean by that. And this would be also helpful in, in for folks to, to uh, understand. Uh, so in a sense, uh, this is, uh, when I talk about it, this is a, also becomes an organizing tool as well that when we, so one of the ways of, of digital intelligence is predictive and predictive policing is predpol. This is an algorithm that is being used by policing. So, so in a sense, LA Los Angeles Police Department using this 
impact on the community about population control and digital redlining and, and displacement as well. But then we, when we started looking at it, that, okay, where did it come from? Well, it came from the University of California, Los Angeles, and various other academic institutions. So the academy is deeply interested in this thing as well. Well, who was originally funding these programs? Where was the Department of Defense uh, funding this to study uh, and predict insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then the Department of Justice and, and the various funding pro federal government got involved in this thing. Well, then that led to the, led to the development of private interest, that how companies were formed around Predpol Incorporated, and, and, and then the, the land developers came in. Then the local government adopted this as like, you know, best thing since sliced bread, like you're saying, like, you know, well, now computers are race neutral. Uh, computers are the answer. Science is objective. Uh, so, you know, and this, that, and the other. So when we, when we looked at it, and when you decentered this thing, it helps us in understanding that, no, wait a minute, this really, this digital intelligence gathering in this case is really about the, the quarantining of poor communities, that how a quarantining effect is created for land developers and gentrification to continue, and ultimately how these are all if, if serving the interest of land development and gentrification, which but it, they they require they require the banishment and movement of people and particularly the undesirables. So or uh, it requires the quarantining or redlining of the undesirables in a particular location as well because they become an eyesore, if you will. Right. So, so in a sense, it's also crucial that when we look at digital intelligence gathering, how are we looking at it, and we are not focused on particular one thing. So it sort of begs our own understanding about the notion of feedback loop of injustice, because it is way beyond the feedback loop of science. That because if injustice is the starting point, then it that starting point serves a much bigger, bigger sinister purpose and insidious purpose of, of land and control of land. So settler colonialism is very alive and well in this day and age as well. I see Trevor has a question for you. Um, what is the relationship between the capitalist state and the racist state? Is there a difference whether there is a Republicans or Democrats in power? And of course, we don't want Trump. As well, um, they have asked that you mention the implications of the academy. You, um, no, you have mentioned the implications of the academy in this. Do you mean the ways the research at universities, do you mean in a way the research at universities support these surveillance agendas, or do you mean something more? As well, I see Aziz has asked that you you elaborate more on, 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 on uh, can you please talk a bit more about the processes of creating some of the campaigns and analysis tools like the Stoker State Diagram and the popular education work around it? seems to be useful. Yeah, I, I think you can answer those questions and add your views on what Dr. Aziz has asked. Certainly. Uh, so uh, quite a bit there, um, um, you know, just uh, of course, um, you, uh, you made a reference to what we would call them republicrats, um, that they basically, I mean, a two party system, I mean, which has as, uh, that by itself, uh, flies in the face of this this uh, this uh, claims of democracy and and equal participation because uh, this is in a sense like I would say these political cartels uh, that control uh, the political system but these polit political cartels are working at the behest of a much bigger interest as well which is a corporate interest um, so I think so so when we talk about uh, plantation capitalism, and when we talk about uh, racial capitalism, I think we, we have to go back and look at the historic trajectory of how that has evolved as well. Uh, that even uh, uh, going back to the constitution that how plantation owners uh, and enslaved owners initially had written, and that's the, that's the, 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 the popular understanding as well. But, but in a sense, how that itself over time has consolidated that power uh, uh, within uh, the 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 uh, systems, which is predominantly, I would say, Anglo-Saxon uh, in nature, predominantly white. Uh, so, in, in so in a sense, when we talk about Republicans and when we talk about Democrats, I mean, these parties are, the, are at the service of the same thing. These parties, both of them, are at the service of of, of, of racial capitalism. These parties are at the service of uh, how to expand. 
uh, more control, more power uh, of, uh, of the corporation, more control, more power of the, of the systems that already exist and are in place as well. So whether it's Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and then quite frankly, when people talk about Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump has been uh, building on a playbook that was already pre-established. I mean, the, the playbook has been there. I mean, the playbook, and when we talk about it, that's why history informs us uh, things as well. We talked about um, uh, Dr. Edward Banfield. So the, this this has been a continuation of that time. It's 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 in a sense now it has it is more in your face. It has given uh, the base that Donald Trump has built is has been always been there. The the militias have always been there. The Klan has been in operation for the for for the longest time. It was like you know just a uh, temper down, but but movements have always been there. I mean, like, you know, so we've had, um, you know, during Obama's time also previously, we know we saw the, the, the Clive and Bundy uh, group and all of these folks who had taken over federal land for cattle grazing, and these were white militias. But had it been black folks or had it been indigenous folks going back to North Dakota, how, how violently that was suppressed versus uh, a group of white land owners taking over federal land for cattle grazing and completely not paying any bills for the for their. So I think these are these are continuing uh, pieces of that. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to shortcut my answers. So, you know, just in the interest of time. But I think going back to uh, Aziza's uh, question about various um, uh, campaigns, uh, this is how we have, uh, we are building our fight uh, as well. Uh, number one, that, uh, that uh, how, uh, and, and it's been sort of layered as well, to better understand that how surveillance and policing uh, is deployed. So what is the intersection between gender and sexuality? How uh, how, uh, uh, you know, femme identified bodies, trans identified bodies, sex workers, various other sectors of the population, how are they being policed, uh, rather than taking one big sort of, uh, you know, milkshaker and putting everybody's experiences into one. These are very particular experiences with the police state. So we have to approach them in a very nuanced way as well, uh, looking at the impact on youth. Uh, we have a whole program about the war on youth and how youth are being impacted, how gang injunctions and gang databases and gang identities are developed, how increasingly youth are being deemed and the language of national security is being used to further criminalize the youth. Um, and then looking at various types of data-driven policing as well, that how technology uh, is being used uh, as a way to mask and create this veneer of science in policing as well, that uh, while we're only gathering data, while we're only, the computers are, are directing us in that, in that uh, uh, providing us with the roadmap as well. So, so that helps us in broadening the scope. Uh, we use a lot of uh, art and culture. Uh, just yesterday or two couple of weeks ago, uh, we took over the mayor's house. Um, and turn that into a, a popular education program. So we do a lot of community education, popular education. We use a lot of zines as well. Um, let me just uh, show you one one tool of our of our. Um, um, uh, as, let me just open it up real quick, and want to share something with you all over here. Um, let me just uh, give me one quick second. Uh, oops. Uh, actually, no. Um, yeah, there we go. And I just wanted to share this real quickly with folks. Okay, so this is a, for example, um, um, one of the one of the, uh, the 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 zines that we came together, and this is the war on youth. So this is uh, on. It's also printable as well. So this was created as a way uh, to reach out to to youth, building power. And this was done in collaboration with Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, Palestinian Youth Movement, Youth Justice Coalition, and a group uh, called Baby Anarchists helped us develop. And it also was Gender Justice LA. Uh, that how different uh, uh, youth of different set orientations are being impacted as well. So it also, particularly in the time in time of COVID, how these become as 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 popular education tools to 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 bring it out onto the streets uh, to share with the community. And so I think these are also the various types of tools. And these are this is on our website as well. 
that, that, that we deploy as well. So, you know, so it's, it's a different ways and particularly now with COVID because we are street organizers. We're still old style door knocking. Um, we still do community education on the streets, uh, use a lot of theater. And, uh, and then now as a result of uh, this virtual outreach because of COVID, uh, we've been reconfiguring ourselves and that's basically how things have been, things have been moving for us as well as far as part of our organizing. And I see this comment about tech imperialism and tech, uh, 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 you know, just I didn't quite read the whole thing. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and that's why um, one of the things I wanted to, uh, I, uh, what, what we did was, again, if, if, if I was to pull this one up, that many of the folks are not speaking about uh, when we talk about ideological frameworks, that we talk about settler colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism, but we also believe that scientific objectivity is increasingly taking on its own sacredness and ideological uh, supremacy as well. That where we need to be, uh, you know, the, we need to be sacrificing our understanding, our own intelligence at the altar of artificial intelligence, whatever the heck that means, uh, and because submit ourselves completely to technology because we are constantly told that, well, technology is here. It's a, it's a fact of life. You can't escape it. Well, okay. We know that, you know, I gotta, I gotta turn the light bulb on uh, sometimes to read. That's one type of technology, but nah, I don't think so. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna allow you to, to reframe me by datafying me and say, well, this is who you are. No, I don't accept that. So we fight back and against these, types of scientific objectivities and things like that too. So, so yeah. Um, thank you very much. And if you can, maybe type the, your website into the chat box so that everyone can see your work. I've, I've noted Philips uh, Howard uh, had a comment for uh, uh, Dr. Aziz. Maybe Dr. Aziz, you could answer to uh, Mr. Philips' uh, comment. I'll give you two minutes. Hi, how's it everybody? Um, so yeah, um, thanks so much for the presentation again, Hamid. Um, so I guess um, I don't want to speak um, sort of like direct, direct, directly back to Philip's um, comment. What, what I'll say is this, is I think uh, I can recommend a number of, of things that people can look at in relation to the um, Canadian context. There are people like Gary Kinsman, for example, whose work you can find online, and I'll type in some links um, there, who've done, I think, really excellent work looking at the national security state in uh, Canada. And of course here, um, the history of colonization um, and also the history here too of slavery in Canada, um, which people don't always know about, are really key to understanding the colonial and kind of racist nature of how capitalism and surveillance um, have uh, always been part and parcel of, um, of, of history here and how if we look now at contemporary struggles against the pipelines, against the, uh, the, the sort of occupation and colonization of indigenous lands, which the whole of the Canadian land base is, is basically uh, stolen indigenous lands, we can see the ways in which um, you know the surveillance state, whether it's the you know the old school or the older school, sort of colonial, then Cold War, and now more digitized, if we like, um, forms um, have this kind of continuity there. So there are some parallels and there are some differences with, um, with 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 the U.S. But what I think is really important, I think, with the work that. Uh, you know, the Stop LAPD Spying um, Coalition has been doing is this kind of, uh, I think, really careful uh, analytical work that is built into the organising too. And when I look at things like the, you know, the stalker state concept and the diagram, I think about, okay, so how can we do that in different con uh, sort of country contexts? How can that be done, for example, in the Canadian context or in the South African context, which can help to, you know, inform and support uh, organising work that's already going on. And I'm thinking here of the kind of work that's been happening with some of the COVID-19 coalition folks in the anti-repression uh, group, and also the work of groups like Right to Know, as well as others that have been involved in 
uh, in those kinds of struggles. So I'll post another few links in there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that one can say, um, but I mean, thanks again. I think it's great that, uh, you know, the, these kind of uh, connections I, ironically are being made in this period where a lot of us are unable to meet face to face or uh, some of us for various reasons can't travel to some places anyway. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Aziz. I see we have uh, less than three minutes. Uh, Hamid, one last round of, of questions. Uh, uh, one uh, states that how do you, are you open for partnership with civil society movements in the global south? And how can they learn from you? Because um, they're behind in such work. As well, another question is on uh, defunding the police. How can we speak about defunding if we don't stop the policies that are there in terms of gun, gun, uh, gun violences in South Africa, in, 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 in the United States. Um, maybe you should take those two. You have two minutes and then, yeah, we will we'll close. Uh, most definitely would be happy to, and we are actually uh, actively working with some of the folks as well in the Global South. Uh, we have an active uh, partnership with, uh, with uh, a group of uh, uh, trans uh, sex workers in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, and how they are organizing on the streets and how they are building their power uh, due to organize against police oppression. So, and then we're speaking to other groups in other parts of the world as well. So we'll be happy to share the work. And, and, and I think it's extremely important that we, that we have to draw these international connections and internationalize our work as well, because it's a global fight. It's a, the, the, it's a global enemy, it's a global fight. It's a global monster with various tentacles uh, that are all over the place. Uh, I think going to the, the defunding question, yeah, I mean, of, of course, uh, the, we also have to acknowledge and we as abolitionists that, that, yeah, interpersonal violence and community violence and various other things are there. They are very present. Uh, gun violence is there, there are several other things, but I think the, the question is that how are various movements coming together? That the, it's also the de-weaponizing, uh, how the big fight against these gun lobbies and the manufacturing and the production and the, and the mass availability. I mean, the highest gun ownership is in the United States and it's escalating because of the political conditions as well. So I think it's also necessary, first of all, that abolition um, is not a light switch. It's not a delete button. It's like where we are right now. How are we thinking ahead? What, what kind of world are we envisioning? And, and what is our fight on the ground? And how are these fights just as we are speaking to each other across you know, multiple time zones, that how are we doing this knowledge exchange? And what are the tactical operations? Like today, we shared the stalker state. So in a sense that, you know, how can we then share this knowledge and help map out like what could it be like uh, locally in mapping out the stalker state, as Aziz was saying, in, in South Africa or other parts of the world as well. So I think these are the steps that we need to, first of all, map out and think intersectionally and think globally as well, uh, and to learn from each other. Uh, and through that, you know, hopefully, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a multi-generational journey, but what is our contribution in this moment at this time that further strengthens the movement because, uh, and, and our time is up, but I will just say that one of the things that has happened since uh, uh, the, the current movement on uprisings, that the ground has shifted. It's definitely shifted, whether it's Trump or Biden or whatever, uh, the youth are there. The ground has shifted and it's shifted on many levels and that tradition of taking away, uh, you know, uh, almost like taking the mic away from the, uh, from the preordained leadership um, and, and people have called it the Jurassic Park where young people are really taking over and re-envisioning the world and, 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 and in a sense that not even getting too caught up in the very old style, old guard, vanguard type language, but really into like, that this effing system is not working. I mean, we'll, we'll deal with, so you have 18, 19, 20, 20. So that's also happening too, that the ground is definitely shifting. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of power in all of that. And there's a lot of power in this conversation that we're having too. Thank you very much, Hamid. And I see that you've shared the link at uh, stoplapdspying.org. We'll definitely visit the site and um, if you have more work that you need to share, you are more than welcome to share it with us at CCS. 
And once again, thank you very much for your time and for the great insight that you have given today. Over to you, Shona. Thanks so much, Andres. Um, Hamid, great presentation. Thanks again. It was really wonderful to engage with you. Thanks to everyone who participated. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much because we are out of time, but I just want a, a, a quick thing. One of the comments was that um, uh, collaborations with organizations and folks in the Global South, and I think these collaborations are really important, these sorts of um, conversations. Um, but I, there was something in that comment that said that the global south is behind on this, but I would just like to boast on behalf of South Africa and say that I don't think South Africa is behind at all. The Right to Know campaign and Tami and Kosi joined us today. Uh, Tami, I don't know if Tami is still there. Um, are really at the cutting cutting edge of these conversations um, and they've been doing amazing work. I mean, they stopped the secrecy bill. They're doing work on the cyberspace. So um, just to boast about South Africa, I, I think we really are doing, you know, our activists and some of these organizations are really doing great work. And to be able to link with you and to work together and to think through tactics perhaps together, I think would be very useful. And I hope that we have more chances to do this. Um, Absolutely. But um, thanks to everyone for participating. Thanks for all the links that folks have shared in the chat, chat box. And I do hope that you will join us next week when we're going to be engaging with community organizer Marjan Sita, who's going to be talking to us about George Floyd and the Minneapolis uprising. Um, and in the meantime, please keep safe. And thank you again. Hamid, thank you for getting up. Thank early. you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Keep safe, everyone. Dan and Andres, please stay behind.